to another program in the award-winning television series, Science in Action. Science in Action is produced by the West's oldest scientific institution, the California Academy of Sciences, now in its 100th year. I have a very interesting ticket that I received just recently. It is a ticket for space travel, a trip to the moon. And this first ticket is good for travel from the Earth to a space platform, which is scheduled to be about 1,200 miles out from the Earth. And then the second ticket is supposed to take me from this space platform by another rocket to the moon. At least that is what it says here. Actually, of course, there are a great number of things that we're going to have to know before either you or I will be able to make a trip to the moon. For example, can our bodies withstand the terrific effects of hurtling through space at, say, 25,000 miles per hour? Well, much valuable information has been gained in this field of aero medicine through the studies which have been conducted on people <coughs> living at high altitudes in the mountains. And so as our first guest on Science in Action, we are privileged to have an authority in this field, Dr. John Lawrence, who comes to us from the University of California. Welcome to Science in Action, Dr. Lawrence. Very glad to be here, Dr. Harold. And I'm glad to uh, uh, know that you're going to start about talking about the effects of altitude on people on the ground. Because uh, I think from what we can learn on the effects of altitude on people living on the Earth, much can be applied later to the problems of the avi aviator flying at altitude in the air. Yes, well now it's not uncommon for a person to travel, say, in a pressurized cabin in a plane at about 14,000 feet, and he thinks nothing of it at all. But there are people that live 14,000 feet and higher and you've made some very important studies on them, and they are found in the highlands of Peru. Now, what can you tell us about that? Yes, well, this area of uh, Peru is the only uh, area in the world where you can find uh, large numbers of people living at high altitude. Actually, in the Alta Plana of Peru, and uh, uh, there are about 165,000 people living between the altitudes of 14,000 and 16,000 feet. And to the medical man, uh, these people, and also the animals, uh, are very interesting. Uh, the animals that are particularly interesting are the yama and the vicuña, the animal that produces that very fine fur. Well, suppose we examine some of the problems that are connected with this, and the first would be uh, oxygen, and the second would be pressure. And suppose, uh, Dr. Lawrence, you give us an idea as to what would be involved now <laughs> as we start from sea level and go up to the top of a mountain in terms of pressure. Well, in terms of pressure, at sea level, as you know, the uh, pressure on the body is about 14.6 pounds mm -hmm. per square inch. Whereas at uh, 20,000 feet, it's about 7 pounds, and at 40,000, about 3 pounds per square inch. Now, let's see how this uh, variation in pressure affects the human being. Well, I know from your work in the study of pressures that they are very, very important. Here at sea level, with 14 pounds pressure, against us at all points, and we exert 14 and a half pounds pressure outward, so that we're sort of an equilibrium. But as we go up into the air, or as we go down to the ocean, then this equilibrium changes, and that's where these problems come in. Exactly. Uh, as you go from sea level to high altitude, the pressure falls off, and secondly, the uh, oxygen pressure falls off, mm -hmm. so that the body is faced with being exposed through the air we breathe with a lack of oxygen, which we call anoxia. Yes, and it takes that pressure to force the oxygen into the lungs. And without that, then uh, if you happen to be a lowlander, you're going to have trouble when you go into high altitudes. That's very true, and it might be a good idea to talk for a minute about uh, how the body utilizes oxygen. Uh, as you know, the uh, oxygen in the air we breathe uh, is exposed to the red cells in our lungs. Yes. The red cells carry the oxygen to the tissues because the red cells contain hemoglobin. Now, let's look at that hemoglobin for just a moment. That is a word made up of two parts, hemo <coughs> and globin. And the hemo means blood, and the globin comes from the word globulin, which means the protein materials in the blood. Well, I think this uh, chart here will uh, help us uh, uh, explain how hemoglobin carries oxygen. Here we have the lungs, which uh, uh, carry the oxygen to the uh, red cells in the blood. And the red cells, in turn, circulate to the tissues and unload the oxygen and then come back for another load. So you have a continuous circuit of oxygen-carrying hemoglobin in the red cells. Well, now, these principles, of course, apply to people who live at high altitudes. Yes. Uh, uh, with less oxygen that the people at high altitude have, 
Uh, the way they compensate for it is by developing more red cells. Mm -hmm. And secondly, one of the most important compensatory adaptation mechanisms is the fact that they can do more work on the same amount of oxygen. How about the chest volume now? You were mentioning a little bit earlier that these uh, high Peruvians have a tremendous chest volume. Well, yes. Uh, now, this is a chest film of a young Peruvian, a copper miner, actually, living uh, at about 16,000 feet. His chest uh, circumference would be around uh, 40 inches uh, compared to a normal, uh, similar age and size sea, well, uh, sea level dweller who's I mean, circumference would be about 36 inches. Let's go back once more again. Uh, now, this one, uh, how about the heart cavity here? That looks quite a bit larger. Well, now, the, the consistent finding in all people who live at uh, altitude is this enlargement of the right side of the heart. Mm -hmm. And we compare that with a normal lowland dweller, and we find that the heart is much smaller. You can see the difference there quite clearly, I think. Yes, well, now, I'd like to ask you something else. What about the red blood cell count in uh, people who live at high altitudes as compared to those <coughs> at low altitudes? Well, uh, in this uh, young uh, Peruvian Highlander, his count is about seven million. Uh -huh. and how about the normal for well, a low normal is about four and a half to five million. And then how about uh, blood uh, volume? That is the total amount of blood in the system. Well, there's quite a striking difference. Now, this uh, man would have about uh, oh, eight quarts of blood. Uh -huh. As compared and, uh, with the normal of about what? About five quarts. About five quarts. Well, now, suppose that I were to go to the highlands of Peru, uh, how long would it take me to acclimate myself to the conditions there? Well, uh, in our experience and that of others, uh, uh, it takes several days mm -hmm. before you become acclimated. But um, uh, in this picture here, in the moving picture, you'll see people in uh, uh, the town that we first go to, La Arroya in Peru, about 12,500 mm -hmm. feet. And the climatization uh, gradually uh, takes place so that at the, in the end of about two months, you're completely climatized. But it's uh, also limited by the fact that uh, you can't uh, reach proper acclimatization above about 22 or 23,000 feet. So you have two factors that, mm -hmm. uh, here that uh, are uh, uh, difficult ones. First, acclimatization is slow. Second, acclimatization is limited to about 22 or 23,000 feet. Oh, yes. Now, all of this, of course, does apply to flyers. Well, yes, of course, in the case of flyers, uh, they ascend to 20,000 or 40,000 or more mm -hmm. in a matter of minutes. Yes. So you have very special problems here. Mm -hmm. Well, now, to tell us about uh, Flyer's problems at altitude, <coughs> we've invited as our second guest on Science in Action, Dr. William Orlob, who comes to us from Hamilton Airfield. How are you, sir? I'm glad to join you, Dr. Harrell, for there needs to be a great deal of debunking about this high altitude flying. Mm -hmm. uh, the problems already considered by Dr. Lawrence, namely pressure and oxygen. In addition to these problems, the Flyer has the problem of acceleration, heat, radiation, gravity, and noise. Of course, uh, all of these various things fit into the general pattern, but uh, modern flying in jet planes that travel faster than sound and up to speeds of more than 1,000 miles an hour brings about these complex problems. There's vertical takeoff, the rate of climb, to mention only two. But of course, all of these problems did not start uh, necessarily with uh, the airplane. We go back to 1875. There was a Frenchman by the name of Tissandier who went up in a balloon to the unheard of height of 28,000 feet. That was more than five miles. Yes, and this was an, indeed an unfortunate and tragic experience for two of Tissandier's companions died in this experiment. Uh -huh. They carried oxygen at all times, but by the time they knew they needed it, it was already too late. Now, Tissandier himself carried oxygen and used oxygen from the ground up. Uh, but even he became unconscious and would have died had not the uh, balloon descended from altitude. That would be a case of anoxia. Yes, anoxia or the uh, very early phases of anoxia, which includes a, a feeling of euphoria or false sense of well-being, which is uh, poor judgment. They feel they're so much better off than they are that by the time they're aware of the danger they're in, it's already too late. Yes, well, I know divers, when they go down, uh, sometimes run into this caisson's disease or decompression troubles or bends. Flyers have the same problems. Yes, indeed they do. Uh, in fact, uh, any decrease in pressure, the flyer will experience pain in his joints. Mm -hmm. This is due to the fact that the uh, nitrogen, which is normally dissolved in the blood under pressure, uh, begins to bubble out, and uh, this creates uh, bubbles in the tendons, muscles, and other tissues of the body. This can cause a great deal of pain. Well, let's assume that this bottle of carbonated beverage contains uh, a nitrogen in solution, and we'll just shake this up. And watch now what happens, uh, the way this nitrogen is going to come out when I take the top off here. 
In other words, that would be the same sort of thing that the change in pressure would uh, do to the blood or maybe to the tissues as a result of this pressure change. That is correct, Earl. In fact, uh, a great deal of work has been done on the high altitude pressure chamber. Uh, that's a device which permits us to study the effects on the flyer of uh, pressure when it's under exact control conditions. Now, well, Dr. Lawrence has done a great deal of study on this uh, high altitude pressure chamber during World War II. I wish we could uh, show you the chamber that we've been working with, uh, Captain Orlov and Dr. Harold, but uh, we have a movie here that uh, shows the chamber in operation. Yes, well, uh oh what's this? I guess this isn't your chamber. No, this must be the first chamber that was ever made. 1878, Paul Baird uh, wrote a book about the experiments that he did on himself. Now, for nearly 50 years, everybody forgot about this man until 1900, aviation came into being, and then, of course, uh, his work became very, very important. Now I guess we're over to more modern well, pressure chambers. Well, this is chamber. the, uh, uh, one of those uh, modern pressure chambers that you can put about 15 men in. Actually, these men are being studied at uh, uh, about 38,000 feet uh, for the high altitude bend. And uh, this work was done for the selection of men who could fly at extremely high altitude without pressure cabin aircraft. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, uh, we found that if you could have crew members all 15 years of age or, or under, you wouldn't need pressure cabin aircraft because 15-year-olds never develop the bends. Mm, that's of course, this wasn't practical. Now, what are they doing here? Well, these men are breathing pure oxygen, 100% oxygen. Um, they're learning to acclimatize themselves under these conditions. It's a rapid process. This is exercise tolerance, these men who are under the the decrease of pressure and at this time breathing 100% pure oxygen. This is uh, to uh, an attempt to bring out this pain in the knees that flyers uh, got during the war at high altitude. And the wrist too, you see. Now, is he having trouble with his wrist there? He's having pain in his wrist now. Uh, the nitrogen bubbles we spoke of are coming out into the joint. Uh, the uh, doctor in attendance there is marking out the points where the man is experiencing pain and uh, which would be the location of these nitrogen bubbles we spoke of. And this was a real problem in World War II because uh, pressure cabin bombers were not uh, uh, very numerous at that time. And uh, of course, now with pressure cabin aircraft, this is not so much of a problem, the bends. Now there's a man clearing his eustachian tube to prevent this pressure, increase in pressure in his eardrums. The man next to him is not quite so fortunate. He, uh, he cannot clear his, he's going to have to have help. Uh, now the doctor in attendance is spraying, is going to spray his nose with a vasoconstrictor drug which will open the eustachian tube and permit equalization of pressure. This relieves the man of the pain he would normally experience in his ears. Again, we see the man breathing 100% pure oxygen. This man has developed pain in his abdomen. Apparently he had pancakes for breakfast and a uh, little pancakes? gas. Pancakes? Yes, pancakes. They're not good for flyers. Flyers in Korea experienced these pains and found out they could not tolerate such things as pancakes for breakfast but, before a high flight. But pancakes on the ground are perfectly all right. Pancakes on the <laughs> ground are all right. Now, he's being, what, taken out into another chamber. That's the lock. He's going into the lock and taken down to uh, sea level. Yes, he has to be recompressed, he, as he it were. He flunked the test. Oh, he flunked, he flunked yeah. the test. <laughs> About half of the uh, young men that we studied, uh, these are Air Force men, we were very resistant to the bends, and about we half were uh, not resistant. A great deal depends on the youth of these men. If they are young men, they survive quite well. Mm -hmm. This is the operator, the man who's adjusting the amount of pressure which simulates high altitude in the chamber. Mm 